Hello, I'm Laura Garcia. I teach philosophy at Boston College in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. And I'm presenting a series of lessons on analytic philosophy, a 20th century philosophy, especially as uh, practiced in Great Britain and in America and the US. Um, analytic philosophy refers primarily to a movement in philosophy or, or maybe a series of movements that began early in the 20th century under the influence of philosophers like uh, Frege, Bertrand Russell, and G.E. Moore. Uh, Russell and Moore were classmates at Cambridge University. As the term analysis suggests, these philosophers uh, gave careful attention to the meaning of terms in our language as a way of clearing the ground for genuine progress on the traditional problems of philosophy. Um, careful attention to meaning, of course, was hardly a new idea in philosophy. Uh, in the early dialogues of Plato, for instance, we find Socrates um, pressing other people to give a precise definition of the concepts they're talking about um, in order to uh, clear things up and to make sure we don't get off on the wrong track. Um, the goal of that kind of careful definition, taken negatively anyway, would be to avoid the errors that might arise from faulty or overly vague definitions of terms. Uh, but the positive goal is to find the truth, uh, since hitting on the right definition can itself reveal the truth sometimes, or even when not, it can at least point us in the right direction in our search for the truth, deflecting us from wrong turns. To take one example, Socrates meets Euthyphro in Plato's dialogue by that same name and asks Euthyphro's help in understanding the true meaning of piety. A number of their initial efforts end in failure, and in fact, the conversation uh, is interrupted abruptly and the dialogue ends inconclusively. Uh, but we do gain some insight into the nature of uh, morality, the relationship between morality and the divine will, and some hints of Socrates or maybe Plato's view of what piety is. Um, in some of the later dialogues, especially Theotetus, um, there's a, a similar effort to find the exact meaning of terms. For instance, what it is to know something. And uh, in Theotetus, the conclusion is that knowledge is uh, true belief accompanied by an account or justification. Uh, this definition has had a long philosophical career. Uh, so what I would like to do in this series of lessons is to uh, give a brief, really historical, more or less chronological analysis or account of developments in uh, British and American philosophy, starting with G.E. Moore and moving through uh, the present day, um, uh, focusing primarily on, you might say, the, um, the heyday or the summit of analytic philosophy in the um, days of logical positivism and the Vienna Circle. But uh, since that has been um, more or less transcended in later years, I would like to spend some time talking about what's happened since then, since the 60s. Um, the 20th century variety of analysis um, does have some differences, I think, um, with the earlier versions that I've talked about in uh, Plato and Aristotle. Um, two especially things, I think, are distinctive of contemporary analytic philosophy. The first is that philosophy is now viewed as the handmaiden of science, um, as taking science as the kind of model of learning, um, instead of as maybe the handmaiden of theology, um, as it was in the medieval period. Um, this philosophy is um, now atheism in philosophy is the default position and um, science has been making great strides when we hit the 20th century, making new technologies possible. Uh, there was a sense even of utopian possibilities and visions and um, at the turn of the century, prior to the Great War anyway, uh, philosophy just found it hard to compete with science in offering a comprehensive vision of life and reality, making people's lives better. Um, there the sciences were the, the hot item. Um, at the same time, philosophy as it was being practiced in Britain had veered away from this kind of empiricist roots in um, philosophers like Hume and had become increasingly airy. Uh, Hegel's grand idealistic system captured the best philosophical minds at Oxford and Cambridge, but it was itself obscure in many respects and made uh, many deeply counterintuitive claims. Analysis then became in part a program of showing that the emperor, in this case Hegel, uh, has no clothes. Um, the second thing that I think is distinctive about uh, contemporary analytic philosophy is it sees many times, sees the task of philosophy to be one of um, dissolving long-standing philosophical problems. 
that is rather than the attempt to find the truth or to build a comprehensive theory or system, there's the sense that uh, maybe just by the, the project of analysis itself, we could uh, make the problems evaporate. We will see that they're pseudo problems or that um, they're based on some kind of uh, misconception that's been produced in us by the way we use our language. Um, this had long been a goal, I think, of some modern philosophers, including Rene Descartes and David Hume. Hume was especially enthusiastic about what we might call the purgative project in philosophy, as he wanted to eliminate concepts that he took to be without merit as not sufficiently grounded in experience. And for Hume, experience meant sense impressions, the, the things that are immediately present in the mind. Um, and I think the wind beneath the wings of that project is often a quest for certainty, an ardent desire not to be deceived by the use of unexamined terms or concepts. Uh, in addition, though, to the purgative project, uh, some philosophers want to advance a more positive, constructive project in philosophy, designed to come closer to the truth about things by way of uh, clear understanding about the way we think about them and talk about them. Um, I think the constructive project has its roots in ancient Greece, as I've suggested, in Plato and Aristotle, also in um, St. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, and surfaces in the modern period as well, I think under the auspices of Thomas Reed's philosophy of common sense. Uh, Reed was a contemporary of Hume, very, um, very critical of Hume's philosophy, and he opens his essays on the intellectual powers of man with this bold assertion. There is no greater impediment to the advancement of knowledge than the am ambiguity of words. So the implication there is if we clear away the ambiguities, knowledge will advance, skepticism will seen, be seen to be what it is, a mere sham, and so forth. Uh, that was Reed's hope. Now, when we get to 20th century analytic philosophy, we find, I think, both these projects, both the purgative and the constructive project, uh, still at work. However, this constructive project uh, took a new twist thanks to advances in logic. Um, new developments in formal logic cause great excitement among some philosophers as they seem more suited for capturing new developments in the sciences, especially in the science of relativity theory. <coughs> Perhaps the new logic would provide a language that would mirror the empirical world in a more clear and more rational way, or that was the hope anyway. Uh, Bertrand Russell and Ludwig Wittgenstein were at the vanguard of this project, which came to be known as logical atomism. The idea was to find the irreducible atoms of language as purified and perfected through the use of the new logic, map them onto the irreducible atoms of experience. And for a time, the attempt to construct such an ideal language or perfected language took center stage in the English-speaking philosophy the world of philosophy, his purpose was to develop a language adequate for the natural sciences. Um, the idea was ordinary everyday language has so many different uses, is open to so many interpretations, has vague and confusing expressions, and the hope was that by introducing a kind of simpler, purer, um, structurally clear language, one could continue to make progress in the sciences and to show the ways it, the foundations of science, quite literally, uh, almost pictorially. Um, this constructive project had held the added promise of aiding the purgative project, uh, showing that many so-called philosophical or metaphysical problems sprang from the sloppy use of language we learned at our mother's knee, or uh, for the Sesame Street generation, the language we learned at Big Bird's knee. Um, so th the pur this purified language project um, which fascinated philosophers, especially in Britain, for many years, um, ultimately encountered so many obstacles that it could not continue, it could not carry on. Uh, but many aspects of its animating spirit remained to fuel the extreme version of empiricism proposed by a group of thinkers who first came together in Vienna, Vienna Austria in the 1920s. Um, they gathered around the philosopher Mort Schlick, who was newly appointed uh, philosopher of science at the university, uh, but most of the members of the group were not philosophers. Many of them were natural scientists, uh, economists, social scientists, mathematicians, um, and they called themselves at first the Vienna Circle. Uh, later in the 30s, uh, with the